Not very, I'm John. Uh, C. Huh. I'm alcoholic. Uh, um, yeah, I remember when Coach called me. Uh, I was at work, and uh, I knew exactly what he was going to ask me when he told me who it was. So, uh, And I'm very glad that I said, of course, I would love to when he asked if I'd speak. So I was always told that's what you're supposed to say. So, um, And... Uh, I guess, uh, you know, Mike said I could speak about anything I wanted to as long as I wanted to. Um, and I've never had a whole hour to tell my story, so uh, I guess I'll just start from the beginning and and uh, tell my story. And I'll probably, uh, you know, probably be a half an hour before I get sober, so that's cool too, isn't it? So, um, but I, uh, I was born in... Uh, in Texas, San Antonio, Texas. My father was in the Air Force at the time, and uh, I had older brother and older sister, and uh, we lived there for about three months before we moved to St. Louis. So if you detect a uh, Texas accent, there, there really is none. There's, <laughs> uh, I may be tall, but I'm, you know, that, that's the length of time I spent in Texas. Um, so I grew up here in St. Louis. Um, I had uh, an older brother and a younger sister and an older sister. My father was a physician. My mother stayed home and took care of us as best she could. She, um, she suffered from uh, depression. And um, I think that the, uh, the upbringing that I had or that we had was, was definitely affected by that. Uh, she spent a lot of time in her room crying. And... Um, and my father spent a lot of time away from the house. Um, we had housekeepers that would come in and do the things that my mother wasn't able to do or willing to do. And um, I, I remember just falling in love with these women. They, there was four of them that I can recall their names with Dorothy Bell, Thelma Green, Martha Coleman, and Catherine Montgomery. And um, they were just so dear to me. And... Um, you know, I don't really know what I'd do if, if they hadn't been part of our family for those years. But uh, I was a, a product of the public school system after I got kicked out of St. Joe's uh, parochial school in Clayton in third grade for changing a grade on my report card and lying about it. Um, the, uh, it, it created quite a stir in the parish. Uh, they passed out our our grade cards, and um, I figured out that I could change an F to an A real easily. And um, then she asked us to come up, and she'd discuss our grades with us, and I'd already changed the grade. So. Um, but I was real happy to leave there. I didn't, I didn't care much for the, uh, for the nuns and the um, corporal punishment that they doled out. Um, so I was put into the public school system, and I was there for... A number of years before my parents thought that I was in need of some discipline, and they put me into a, a Jesuit school for a year and a half, and the Jesuits pretty much gave up on me too, and I was back in the public school system. But um, in the public school system that I went to, um, there was a lot of drug use. And before I started drinking, I, I started using drugs. And, uh, you know, alcohol was in our house, my father gave me alcohol when I wanted it. He'd pour me a little, a little glass out of his can of bush beer. And I remember he always put salt in it. And for some reason, I thought that that helped the flavor. So I'd do the same thing. And, um, but, uh, you know, I liked doing what he did. And uh, uh, I don't, I never remember him acting alcoholic. He didn't drink to excess. Um, if anything, he was a workaholic. Um, and the childhood that I had was, um, you know, I really can't say that I suffered any. I was given what I wanted. Um, I was sent to summer camp. I was uh, part of the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts. And um, the only thing that I really thought that I lacked was seeing that love between my parents that I would see other families have. And um, we'd go on family vacations together, and I recall, um, you know, my mother having an episode, and she'd spend pretty much the whole time in her room 
And there was one time we were in um, the Bahamas at Christmas vacation, and she was in her room most of the time during that period. I was down by the marina with my brother. This was in Grand Bahama Island back before it got real developed. And um, looking at the boats in the marina, and the next thing I remember, I was in a, uh, one of the hotel rooms with some stranger. And somehow he had lured me back into his room and had me on his bed, not on the bed, but sitting on the bed. And he was showing me magazines, like porn magazines. And I remember just bolting out of the room and um, not saying anything to my family the whole time. And being very angry with my brother and my father for in following years, realizing that... Um, you know, they were supposed to be looking after me, and, and they didn't. And, um, you know, I was put in that situation that, to this day, I don't think anything happened other than, um, you know, what I said, where I was sitting on the bed, and he was trying to get me interested in some magazines that he had. But um, that sort of, for me, there was a, a disassociation that I had with my family where... Um, they would send me to summer camp, and then the rest of them would go on vacation somewhere. And, you know, I thought, well, that's cool. You know, I kind of liked it. And um, I was a summer camp in Colorado, and they were also vacationing in Colorado. They were in Vail, and they came to visit me one weekend, and I saw their car pull up to the lodge there, and um, I split. I went on a hike. I didn't want to see them. And... Um, you know, when I came back, my counselor told me, your, your, your folks were here, your family was here to see you. You know, they're, they're really sorry they missed you. And, um, you know, I've never told my parents, my family, that I had no interest in seeing them. You know, I was maybe two or three weeks into my six-week um, vacation away from home, and um, uh, how dare they interrupt me. So, But um, that was sort of a, a progressive thing for me where I... And I've described it as being more of an emotional runaway than a physical runaway in my family where I was able to <clears throat> remove myself from what was going on in the family and uh, fantasize about being somewhere else or being in someone else's family, never wanting to bring friends home, um, always preferring to go to someone else's house after school. You know, my, my mother always asking me, don't I have friends? Would you like to bring them here? <laughs> No, <laughs> but uh, so the drug the drug use started. Um, I went to uh, Ladue High School, and um, during that period, everybody it seemed used drugs. Everybody that I knew used drugs. Um, some used more, some used less, and, and uh, um, I got into dealing drugs only because if I did that, if I could buy a, you know pound a pot that I could sell off whatever I needed to and break even or actually make some money. And, um, you know, I was selling the guys that went to Country Day and girls that went to Mary Eye. And, you know, we'd meet at uh, Rhodes Park right up the street before school. But um, then um, alcohol started uh, and pills. And we had a group that would get together on the weekend and I would grab my, my father's PDR and we'd all bring pills that we had found in our parents' medicine cabinets and try and figure out what they were and how much we needed to take to get whatever effect. And um, there were some times where we got pretty sick, but it, there was a lot of Valium, is what we recall, uh, a lot of Valium and a lot of Quaaludes. And um, uh, we, we figured out what was good and what was bad. And mixed in with this was a lot of vodka and a lot of beer. And uh, I remember the, um, you know, the pina coladas, and you know, it was just a big, it was just a big drunk party on the weekends. And during the week, it was a lot of smoking pot and a lot of smoking hash. And I somehow I managed to get through high school. I don't know how, but uh, there was a counselor there, Mr. Phelan, that uh, he was my savior. He really was. He he seemed to understand me and. Uh, um, uh, I loved him, and he was he was like a father figure. Um, you know, my parents didn't really um, 
like like I see a lot of parents doing today where they kind of make a project out of their child and get involved with their schoolwork and you know what they do at home and homework <clears throat> my parents seem to just let me do my own thing um, my brother and both sisters went through uh, private schools and they all graduated with honors and uh, here I was just barely squeaking, squeaking through but I, uh, after I graduated from high school, I went to uh, uh, community college for a couple semesters. And I had a, a, a talent for art, which I exhibited at that in high school, but um, was kind of cultured when I was in, in, uh, at Merrimack. And uh, I ended up going to the San Francisco Art Institute to study photography. And that was the first time I'd really been away from home. And uh, uh, I didn't have any money, and I don't think my father really understood, you know, that it was going to cost money to live out there. But he was paying for my rent for an apartment mm -hmm. in, Ber in Berkeley. It was a nice place, but, um, you know, I didn't have any money. And uh, I was spending most of what I did have on film or paper and, uh, and the rest on beer. And by that time, I was pretty much just drinking alcohol all the time. I had, I had given up on on drugs. Uh, there was a, a terrible paranoia that I experienced uh, on some acid trips and um, just realized that I could handle the, the dulling, the dulling um, high or dulling low that I got out of drinking. And... and uh, and I, quite frankly, I, I really liked uh, the taste of beer. And uh, so uh, I had friends who kind of did the same thing where we'd get together and, and um, make pina coladas and, uh, and vodkas and uh, uh, we'd drink on the weekends and, and I'd drink all week. I would just, I would just start in the morning and uh, just make it through the day drinking. And... Um, but I loved it out there. I really, really, truly loved the, the school. I loved uh, the people that I was in school with. I loved the instructors. And uh, California was like a dream to me. Um, it, was, it was also a, a sexual awakening for me, you know, to say the least. I, uh, um, um, I was like the guy that fell off the cabbage wagon or something, you know, and, and uh, but uh, I loved it dearly. And um, I started this this travel between and and what it really was, was, uh, was uh, uh, an escape. I think the name that I, I used to use for it. Um, but I traveled to the East Coast and lived there for a while, and I traveled back to the West Coast and lived there for a while. A geographic, geographic cure, I think is the term that's commonly used. And my, uh, my older sister lived in Colorado, and I would stay with her for a while. And this, uh, this travel continued for a number of years until I, I left school and I ended up on the East Coast. And uh, um, I moved from San Francisco to Nantucket Island which was a pretty sweet place to live back then, um, except in the winter. It was terribly cold and windy, but uh, it was a great place if you liked to drink because everybody drank there. And uh, they, the bars stayed open, and um, in the summer it was like a, a big party. There was um, summer population increased probably 30,000. And, um, you know, it was fun. It was fun. The, the gal that I, that I was dating and living with there um, was a waitress. She worked in a um, nice restaurant. And I would go there and, and drink for a while and get free drinks at the bar. And then I'd go off and on my circuit, basically, of the different nightclubs and bars until I passed out somewhere. <clears throat> and sometimes it would be passed out in my car in the driveway where we were living. And she wouldn't wake me up, but um, occasionally she'd reach in the car and just turn the engine off or something and just let me sleep there. And um, um, 
You know, when, when I started reading Chapter to the Wives, a lot of the way she reacted to my alcoholism was in a very, what I found out to be a very healthy way. She didn't let it bring her down. She was able to stand her ground. Um, if I asked her to call in sick for work, she'd refuse. And, um, um, you know, I don't know where she got that, really, I don't. Uh, I, I had had girlfriends prior to that that, uh, you know, they said, sure, what else can I do for you, you know? And, and, uh, but um, Susan was a, a, a really strong woman, and, and um, um, I really admire her for doing that. And, and basically, she, um, she kind of kicked me off the island. She, um, one of the reasons I left was um, because she had, wanted to have nothing more to do with me. And um, about the same time, I had an offer to move back to Missouri and Farmington, which is just south of here. Uh, and my, my father owned a, a, a cattle operation there was uh, about 1,200 acres, and there was a couple other guys working there. And I just thought, well, wouldn't that be fun, you know? Um, another geographic cure, but also something that uh, uh, was sort of waiting for me, I thought. And uh, uh, little did I realize that my father kind of knew what was going on with me. And um, he had been... In the early days of the Highland Center, he had been involved with their developing up a program that they had there, and um, he would show. It was sort of an aversion therapy since he was a pathologist. He would show slides of patients' livers and you know brains that they had removed, and um, you know other things from um, other organs from chronic alcoholics, and so he w- he was familiar with the Highland Center and. Uh, but um, so I moved back to Missouri, and um, and it's interesting because it was 30 years ago, and when we had that big storm, uh, I pulled in the Missouri that night, and you know I just heard them saying the other day it was the 30th of January of 1982 was when I came back to Missouri, and um, so I was pretty much um, snowbound down there, and. Um, the house that I was living in was heated with wood, so I was responsible for cutting the wood to heat. You know, if I wanted to be warm, I had to stoke the furnace, which was a wood-burning furnace. But um, I knew nothing about raising cattle, and I tell people I didn't know the difference between a Holstein and a heifer. And um, I don't hear any chuckling, so I'm thinking most people here don't either. But. <laughs> A Holstein's a breed of cow. A heifer is a, a young female. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but I did find out very quickly where the bars were in Farmington and where the bars were in Fredericktown and where they were in Flat River, where they were in Bon Terre, and all the way up to St. Louis because I still had a lot of friends that lived in St. Louis. And I'll tell you that 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 year, since I didn't have Susan looking over my shoulder, wondering how much I was drinking, or when the checks would come back from the bank, uh, putting them in a stack. I recall her doing one time all the checks that were written to the liquor store and all the other checks. And the liquor store checks were like, you know, a stack like this. And the other checks were, you know, maybe three or four. But um, I had nobody... Nobody monitoring my drinking, and I drank with impunity. Um, I would drive and drink constantly. Um, And as I said, I had friends that lived here in St. Louis, and I would drive up and meet them at bars, and they would they would ask me why why I I I wouldn't slow down, or why why didn't I drink like them? Because I was just I was drinking to get drunk every time we would meet in a bar. And after a while, I thought, um, well, to solve that, I'm just going to drink, you know, a couple six-packs on the way up so I'll be nice and, you know, settled in. So when I did sit down in a bar with them, uh, they wouldn't be asking me, why don't I slow down or nurse that beer? And uh, it really didn't make any difference. And a lot of times, it, it, it what ended up was the... Um, 
bartender refused to serve me or the waitress refused to serve me because I was, you know, I was drunk when I showed up. Um, one of my favorite places to come to was a place called Tom's Bar and Grill down here in Euclid and Forest Park. Mm-hmm. And I had a friend who was a, a barmaid there. And um, I drove a big three-quarter ton pickup truck back then. And I pulled into the alley there next to Tom's and went inside to uh, see if Carol was working. And next thing I know, I'm sitting there at the bar drinking a beer and a St. Louis police officer walks in with my Marlin 3030 in his hand asking whose truck that is in the alley because the engine's running. Take the gun and lock it up and move the truck. And this was back in 1982. And I I dare say that uh, I doubt that the police would say the same thing today. But um, I had a series of episodes like that where um, I would leave my car running, my truck running. Uh, There was another time when um, I had crawled in a window to sleep in a friend's apartment. And um, she got up the next morning to go to work and went out. It was on on Demon. And she went out and she said, came back in a, you know, a couple of minutes later and said, Cooper, your truck's out in the street, in the middle of the street, and the engine's running. And, you know, hell, I didn't know. I just sleeping on the couch, you know. Um, but there was that, that series of episodes like that where I just felt like my, my drinking was leading me out of control. Um, I stopped coming up to St. Louis so much and, and started to go to the bars in Farmington. Um, one of my favorite ones was Redneck Mothers in uh, Flat River. It was a, a biker bar, you know, like real nice clientele there. Uh, but they left me alone. I mean, I, I had a beard like, like Brian there and, you know, kind of long hair. And, but uh, and another one was, was called the Copper Bell, which was right by the, uh, by the courthouse there. And um, uh, I got to know the the owner of that place pretty well, and um, and there was a woman who used to drink there. Whenever I was there, she was always there, and, and she'd sit at the end of the bar and take a look at me and tell me that she thought I was an alcoholic, you know. And I think, well, if I'm an alcoholic, you know, what about you? You know, you're doing the same thing I am. No, no, you're a real alcoholic. You shouldn't be drinking. And um, I don't know how many times I left that place with a six-pack to go, and I lived about seven miles south of Farmington. And I recall taking that six-pack and chucking it out the window because I didn't want to drink anymore. And a couple hours later, I'm out there with a flashlight looking for it. (laughs) And, uh, you know, just the, the... the fear that I had every time I stopped drinking, or started drinking, and the the worry I had that I that I wouldn't be able to make it without alcohol. It was um, it was something that um, really started to take a hold of me. Um, I had a calendar on the on the wall in my kitchen that I would draw these little upside down wine glasses on the days that, you know, I stopped drinking on this day, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw that and then kind of chart how long I could not drink. And um, I did that in case, you know, remember my family came in and wanted to know what it was, you know, so it was sort of my, my code. But, but the, the calendar would just be full of those little wine glasses, upside-down wine glasses. And um, um, I remember it was in... Uh, early January, where I was in, it was in 2000 and 2000, and, or excuse me, in, um, 1983, where I was in St. Louis, and my father was driving me around. I came up for the afternoon or something, and he uh, he drove me by the uh, St. Anthony's Hospital and the Highland Center, and uh, you know we just kind of drove in the the drive there, and he pointed it out. And, <clears throat> I mean, it was a pretty place. It had, had like a lake around it, and had ducks and everything, and you know, nice bridge that went across to the to the uh, front door. You know, he just said, "This is you know an alcoholic rehabilitation center," and um, 
He never once said, I think you should go here. Never once did he say that to me. But he, uh, he definitely planted a seed for me because uh, it was in, uh, on February 5th, 1983, I was driving back from, from the Copper Bell like I had done many times before. I don't think I chucked the beer out of the window this time. It was, it was Sunday afternoon and it was snowing slightly. And um, I don't know if I fell asleep or, or just drove off the road, but I, I drove off about a quarter mile from the house, drove off one side, corrected back on, back off, and then the truck rolled three times and um, um, tore the tires off the wheels. Uh, the hood was up, the cab was smashed down, the um, toolbox was open and everything was thrown out of it and all. But uh, um, the truck ended up on its, on its wheels and I was able to start the engine and drive the remaining quarter mile home. And I had a neighbor who lived across the street from me, and, and he told me later that he heard me coming up the street, <coughs> up old Jackson Road. And uh, he just looked out the window and saw this thing going by and just kind of shook his head. <laughs> but uh, I got into the house, and I called my father. And I told him what had happened, and I said, I think I'd like to, to check that place out. And he came down and picked me up, and uh, I stayed at his house that night. And the next morning, Monday morning, I was sitting across the table from Dr. Olms, and he was telling me that uh, if I was going to be successful at this, I wasn't going to drink again. And I said, yes, sir, whatever it takes. And uh, so I went to my room, and I, the reason I bring these here, these three books were sitting on my bed. In, in uh, these exact books we're sitting in my bed in the Highland Center um, I, used, I used these a lot this one I traded in for something called Daily Reflections because Daily Reflections is a uh, conference approved and it's also half the price mm. but um, so um, I went through the 30 day treatment program there uh, how am I doing on time? Oh good, that's good That's good. Uh, went through the 30 day treatment program there and um, just just lapped it up. I was uh, I was there for less than a week, and I heard a guy named Mike Power speak. He gave these um, every Thursday night. He gave an informational talk on alcoholism, and um, I just loved it. And I was calling my friends who were still drinking, and I was telling them they got to come hear this guy. You know, this guy is he's got the answer. And and they're like, yeah, sure, okay, fine, all right. Um, but um, um, after two weeks there, you could sign up on a on a, a sign up sheet down by the front desk, and um, there were these guys that came from the Afton Christian Church, and they had a big van, and they take you to an outside meeting, and that was the first AA meeting I went to outside of the Highland Center. It was over on Tesson Ferry, Highway 21. Hmm? Yeah, at the Afton Christian Church. Yeah. And uh, I remember going down into the basement and they passed around. The, and, you know, it was, um, I mean, it was just, I, I was as excited about being in a meeting then as I am when they passed the sign-up sheet today. Uh, it was It was really thrilling. And, uh, you know, when they called my name and uh, uh, somebody nudged me and said, tell me you're an alcoholic. And um, uh, because I had been hearing other people say and, um, you know, so I was able to say, my my name's John, I'm an alcoholic and this is my first meeting. And um, and it was pretty cool. It really was. Um, But after I got out of the Highland Center, I I, um, went back to Farmington. there's a place just as you get off 55 onto 67 called Pippin Towing. I don't know if any of you know the area down there, but this towing company would put their latest wreck right out by the road. And uh, that was a visual aid for me for many years. And um, um, because I'd come up to St. Louis and go to the aftercare program they had 
and also I started volunteering on that day. I'd come up every Thursday and volunteer for the day and then go to the aftercare program that evening. And um, But I can remember feeling really nervous being on the road because I knew that there was drunks out there on the road. And uh, I was worried that uh, you know one of them, like I drove, was going to run into me. <laughs> so uh, it was sort of like watching for deer on the road. But um, so I, I started going to meetings in Farmington. Uh, they were really different from the meetings I was familiar with in St. Louis. Um, there were no women going to these meetings. There was nobody my age going to these meetings. Uh, and at the time, I guess it was guys that are my age now. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to take me to the uh, Shoney's there in town after the meeting, and they all sat around, smoked, and told dirty jokes. And, um, you know, I didn't really catch on. Um, so I started to come up to St. Louis again to go to meetings, and I would come to uh, the Linda Club a lot. And there was a lot of guys that were my age who had similar amount of sobriety, and um, I remember coming up on Friday evenings, and, and there were women in the meetings, and we're all, we all go out and get something to eat in the Central West Inn afterwards. And it was the first time in my life that I had been able to enjoy other people like that, to be able to go you know, kind of on group dates with other people and not have the intention of this date ending up in bed with somebody. And um, I really liked that. I did... Really liked it, and um, so in nineteen, let's see, in nineteen eighty six, I was in Clayton, and um, I ran into a woman that I had known when I was at uh, at Merrimack Community College, and um, uh, I had an amend to make to her, and I reintroduced myself and and told her who I was and. Um, told her that I was a member of a 12-step program and part of the recovery is making amends. And um, she said, oh, you mean Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, yeah, exactly. And she said, well, I went to my first meeting last night. She was... And so uh, this is a woman I'm married to today. But uh, so we dated for three years and got married in 1989. Um, and some of you know Sandy is... Uh, but uh, that first meeting she went to was at Group 44 uh, there at Central Service. And that became a meeting that both of us went together, went to together. And uh, my first sponsor, John O., was a member of that group. Um, but in 1989, I uh, moved back to St. Louis. Um, I got married and went back to school. And I stopped going to meetings. And um, this went on for close to nine years. And I got really busy. I, I got really busy with school, and then I had a job. And um, I remember stopping by Central Service during this period and um, talking to Tom Evans, who was the office manager then. And um, he was a good, a good touchstone for me. Um, you know, I, I knew when I stopped drinking that um, no matter what happened in my life, drinking was only going to make it worse. That was something that was um, from, from the very beginning. Um, you know, my, I know Mike Powers tells that story about the guy that keeps getting beat up trying to figure out how he can prevent getting beat up this time and somebody yells out, don't get in the ring. You know, and, and for me that was that was a story I told myself over and over. You know, that was it was uh, something that, that uh I connected with when I heard it from him and um so I knew I wasn't gonna drink. But my life got miserable. I got miserable, my marriage got miserable. And um in 1998, I started thinking that something something was going to happen in my life that I would just not be able to handle, that I would be inconsolable. I thought that it was going to be a death of a parent. Um, I started seeing a counselor. And um, 
you know, I wasn't talking about my alcoholism with her. I was just talking about how horrible I felt and how worried I felt. And um, But Sandy and I started having difficulties, and um, I, I thought that we were going to get divorced. Uh, and um, um, my reaction to what was going on between us was to go out to Colorado that summer and spend some time with my family, which is where I spent some part of most every summer. My mother at that time was living in Colorado, and I had two sisters out there. My older sister was in the program, and her husband was also in the program. And uh, they lived in Boulder. And in 1998, my brother-in-law was dying of colon cancer. And I went out there to see him for the last time. And then uh, my mother and my sister and I, my younger sister, went up to Vail. And we had a nice condo in Vail. And it belonged to Mike Shanahan and Jack Kemp. And, I mean, my my room was half the size of this. And I had my own jacuzzi and everything. And, and a door that went out to look on the Gore Creek. And I was miserable. I I was miserable. And um, I picked up the phone book in Vail, Colorado, and looked up AA. And I went to a meeting there at the, the, I think it's a multi-denominational chapel they have. And, um, I mean, it was, after I left that meeting, I I was feeling really good. I was, I felt like I was, doing exactly what I was supposed to be doing. I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And um, when I came back to St. Louis, Sandy and I got into marriage counseling. We had a a friend who told us about a woman who um, was Al-Anon, 30 years Al-Anon, and and she was just the perfect fit for Sandy and I. And, um, And we got our marriage back on track. And we were both going to meetings again. And, um, you know, there's a line that uh, in the big book saying, um, tell your man that's working with others, tell your man that he can get sober, you know, even if he doesn't get his family back. And I was determined that I was going to uh, get my sanity and my, my recovery back on track, even if it meant that my marriage wasn't going to be, wasn't going to survive. But... Um, I think the fact that I accepted responsibility for the role I played in the situation that I found my marriage in was a big factor in in the recovery of my marriage. And and I know that I learned taking responsibility through this program and my recovery. Um, my, My marriage is better than it's ever been today. Um, I know that um, my wife has been through ha- has had a lot of health issues that um, I'm really thankful that I was able to be present for that and um, you know the guys in the program that were able to stand by me when I asked for help and I think that that's uh, you know something that I can't imagine going through uh, for instance, you know, when Sandy told me she had uh, breast cancer, and um, you know, my first reaction was, uh, I can't believe this is happening to me. You know, being a selfish <laughs> alcoholic that I am. But my first response was to um, was to give her a hug and, and ask, what you know, what can I do to help? Um, but she's had a series of other um, health problems, and and you know, Mike is has been there at the hospital with me and um, you know Jim Devlin has been a, a really strong friend um, but um, um, something else in my sobriety today is um, that I got back into is service work and I know Mike says you know I, I'm a good example of someone doing service work and you know actually in the home group that I was in which was 212 on Saturdays at St. Michael and St. George, um, they needed an alternate GSR. So I said, fine, I, you know, I'll do that. 
Well, the GSR decided he didn't want to do it anymore, so there I find myself as a GSR, a group service representative. So at the time that I was a group service representative, um, District 4 decided that they were going to split into three separate districts. And my home group was in district, which was going to be 4-1, and they needed a DCM. So a DCM is a, a district committee. committee member. Right. So this puts me on an area level. And the next thing I know, um, I'm going to a, a Southwest Regional Forum, and Ed is the delegate, and um, I'm just having a ball. I, you know, And I'm meeting people all over the southwest region of the United States that are doing the same thing I am. And it's like having this this whole other big home group of people from this part of the country. And, um, you know, I was just, it was, it was an immersion into service work at the time that um, it, it was the best thing for me. I, I, I loved it, and I never looked back, and whenever... Um, Someone asked me, would I serve on a committee, whether it was on the district or the area level? I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'd love to do that. And, um, um, you know, being an IR, grapevine rep, um, PICPC, you know, all the different ones that, that I could serve on. Um, I, really, uh, I really appreciate what those people do, and uh, I'm glad that, that I'm asked to do that, too. So, um, you know, I don't want to start getting on the soapbox about service work, but I think it is a really, really important thing to get involved in. Um, see what else I want to talk about. There, there is a um, my 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 literature today. You know, I told you this is what I had in my bed when I went to um, uh, Highland Center. My literature today is is this little book. And it's the first 164 pages plus Dr. Bob's story. And I feel, as far as a big book, that's all you need. Uh, the stories in the big book, they change with every edition that comes out. Um, I'm a grapevine rep now, so I can tell you, if you want to read some current contemporary stories, just pick up a copy of the grapevine, and a lot of those stories originated in the grapevine. Um, and there is a, a piece that I wanted to read. That's, that appeared in the grapevine uh, in 1973, the April edition. And, and I'll just close with this, but I, I really like this. Uh, it's it's uh, by a guy named Dick H. And the title is called Positively Negative. It says, We can be positive that our drinking was negative. We drank for happiness and became unhappy. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank to be outgoing and became self-centered. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for sophistication and became crude and obnoxious. We drank for friendship and made enemies. We drank, in the, we drank to soften sorrow and wallowed in self-pity. We drank for sleep and awakened without rest. We drank for strength and felt weak. We drank for sex drive and lost our potency. We drank medicinally and acquired health problems. We drank because the job called for it and lost the job. We drank for relaxation and got the shakes. We drank for confidence and became uncertain. We drank for bravery and became afraid. We drank for certainty and became doubtful. We drank to stimulate thought and blacked out. We drank to make conversation easier and slurred our speech. We drank for warmth and lost our cool. We drank for coolness and lost our warmth. We drank to feel heavenly and knew hell. We drank to forget and were haunted. We drank for freedom and became slaves. We drank for power and were powerless. We drank to erase problems and saw them multiply. We drank to cope with life and invited death or worse. So I just want to close with that. I thought that uh, uh, it's kind of a 
happy note to end on, when you say. So thanks for letting me uh, letting me talk tonight. Uh,